today I want to get, like, talk a, a little bit about um, machine learning for developers. Um, and um, I'll kind of give a, first a little bit of an introduction and then I'll dive into um, some of the research um, that we have done um, to use machine learning to enhance the developer uh, life cycle. Um, so I already mentioned uh, that my team is kept like, you know, um, working on this, so we can skip this one. Um, and here's the, the um, insight that I got a few years ago is that we have been kept, like having these kind of like, you know, go to conferences, but also more academic conferences for many, many years. Um, but we still don't seem to know how to write code. Uh, it's it's very difficult. Um, so maybe um, we as humans need some like mental prosthetics to help us um, write code. And of course, this already exists. And if you look at IDEs and so on, but can we get, like even go further with that? Um, and then the other kind of shift happened. So like if you look at a, a human developer, and the joke is that they turn coffee into code. Um, but when you look at machine learning, you take data and then you can have, like, you know, um, use some like machine learning gadget and then you get a model, but a model is just another uh, word for code. Um, and that's a kind of very powerful um, um, paradigm. And as long as you have enough data, um, and that's the kind of, like, you know, the crux here, you need to have like an, enough training data. And then you have a chance to turn that data into a model uh, that you can then use. So, um, and in the developer space, as we will see later, uh, there's a lot of data. So that's kind of like sounded like a very fruitful um, avenue to, to try. And I also, um, this is another thing why I kind of like shifted away from programming languages and uh, frameworks is that this is really, I think, a disruptive um, thing that's happening for developers. I, somebody says, I said, like, you know, I think it, it was Jeff Dean, um, that in the future, half of all code will be learned. Um, and I'm pretty sure that, like, you know, after this conference where you've heard various companies talk about, like, how they're using ML, that this is not an ex exaggeration, right? Like, you know, like more and more of, like, handwritten software um, will be taken over by um, learned code. Um, and that means that as developers, we have to be aware of that. But on the other hand, um, as developers, we can also leverage this fact, right? Because we can use this, like, you know, um, this technology to make our lives easier. And this, this thing is called software 2.0. Um, and um, so this is the idea of uh, the research I'm presenting is that software is eating the world. Um, and then I kind of argued that ML is going to eat software. Um, but since we are smart as developers, we say, let's then use um, ML to boost software, right? That's kind of like, you know, we don't let kind of like our lunch be eaten. We're going to just leverage um, ML to uh, make ourselves more productive. Um, a little bit on how my team operates. Um, we are, um, the way I look at it is that we take away the risk for the product teams. Um, so the product teams, um, I'm, I'm part of Facebook or Meta's infrastructure. Um, and so these people are there kind of like, you know, keeping the systems up and running. Um, and so we have to get like, you know, like, and the stuff that we're doing is very risky, right? We don't know whether these tools actually will work. So the way my organization operates is that we look kind of like three to five years out um, and then kind of like, you know, try to predict what we should do now such that like, you know, in the future, um, our developers are still kind of like productive. Um, and then we take that risk, we got like, you know, develop these new technologies and we bridge that gap. And once um, the things that we work, uh, that we work on 
our de-risk, we usually spin that off to the regular product team. So then they get operationalized and integrated in the regular workflow. And then we can kind of like start to do new things. So I'm kind of like, you know, a little bit um, like a venture capitalist where I kind of run high risk projects and then we have exits, except it's got kind of like within the context of, um, of, of, of Meta. Um, and, and we have been spinning off kind of like teams uh, regularly. And in particular, all the work that I'm showing you today um, has been de-risked and, and we have recently spun that off to the relevant uh, product teams. Um, so this is not science fiction anymore. This is really stuff that's running for real that people are using. Um, and my uh, team, the prototype or the archetype of people that work there is we are kind of like half researchers, half hackers. So we're trying to bridge that world. And you cannot just do pure research because you have to kind of like implement it. But we also kind of like, you know, cannot just hack things together. We have to kind of like understand the, the, the research and um, we write papers about that to make sure that um, we get peer reviews from, from the research community about it. Um, and then of course, some of the work is open sourced as well. Um, so what is it that we do? And as I said, like, you know, it, there's a lot of, like in order to use machine learning, you need to have training data. And fortunately, um, developers generate um, an enormous amount of data. So this, um, these numbers are, like, you know, just a Google search away. Um, they probably, the minute I wrote them down, they are already outdated. And um, if you look at GitHub, there's like two, two, 200 million repos. There's like 73 million developers. And um, if you look at uh, phones, there's 3 billion active uh, Android devices. Imagine the kind of like amount of data they produce in terms of like crashes, um, and so on. Um, if you look at like IDEs, uh, JetBrains has hundred uh, or sorry, ten million users, and that generates a, a, a lot of data as well. And then Stack Overflow um, is also kind of enormous, right? So, um, and of course, within your own company or within Meta, there's also kind of like lots of data being produced. So our idea was like there's a lot of data here. Can we leverage that as training data to train um, ML algorithms uh, that like automate away like boring tasks for developers and making them more productive? And so that's the kind of like you know the main idea here. Like how do we turn all that data into actionable insight? And our goal is to make every developer a 10x developer, right? So it's like. Um, as I said, prosthetics for developers, um, and and that's the gap. Like you know, so we we power developers using machine learning to make them more productive, and that's the goal. And and here is the kind of like you know how we do this, um, and it's kind of like you know like machine learning is often seen as something that like you know esoteric or whatever, but it's kind of interesting that there's a very kind of deep relationship with querying. So if you look at the database, what you do there is you send code to the database. We call that code usually a query and you get back data, right? We do this all the time. And um, now what you do with machine learning is you have some gadget that you send data and it gives you back code. Um, and that code is usually called a model, but it's, it's exactly the kind of like the dual of uh, querying, right? So query, you give it code, it gives you data. Uh, ML, you give it data, it gives you code. Um, but there's even a deeper um, connection. Um, and I talked about this, like, I don't know, uh, more than 10 years ago, I think, at Go to Amsterdam. Um, where I kind of showed that if you look at a, a typical query, um, so select from where, group by, having order by, um, then all the machine learning algorithms um, kind of like, you know, help you to fill in the blanks in your query. 
Um, for example, if you want to do a group by, uh, but you don't know like how to group by, group by what, well, then you can learn how to do grouping by using clustering or classification. Um, or if you need to order by, but you don't know how to order by, well, that's where you use ranking. So th the nice thing is that like, you know, um, we're, we're learning all these pieces of, of a query um, and then we can kind of like, you know, use um, the, those machine learned algorithms to extract that knowledge from all that data as well. So it's kind of like, I think, um, I, I kind of like this picture here. It's like, you know, like the, the querying data is still important, but um, often we don't know how to write the, the, these kind of like pieces of the queries and we can learn them. Um, and it's got like, you know, like simple here clustering is you have a bunch of things and you want to um, collect similar things into buckets. Um, and we'll see got applications of that. Um, classification, you get something and you want to get like label it, what this thing represents. Um, and then regression is you want to learn a function that you can give inputs and it will give you uh, an output usually in numeric uh, ways, right? Um, and the way, um, I don't know, this is kind of like a super high level um, way of how this works um, is you have your training data and typically your training data is kind of like, you know, an input and an output um, and then you can have, like, you know, you have some trainable parameters um, and your model is some composition of differentiable functions. And then you compare the output of your model, the, the guess with the output that's from your training data, you compute the loss function, and then you update the parameters based on the gap, like, you know, the derivative of this gap, the, the composition of the loss function and the model. Um, so it's kind of like, you know, uh, in some sense, pretty simple, but what you see is that it kind of like requires that you have um, a way to talk about your loss function. And um, so what's the differences between your output um, and the kind of like the guess that the model makes. And you have to think about your model architecture. And um, so it's not kind of like, you know, completely trivial. Um, and as we'll see later, it's like, you know, like, this model architecture is still kind of like some form of programming. Um, all right, so now let's um, zoom in or, or talk about the developer workflow, right? Um, and if you uh, um, ask a typical developer here in the audience, what is what do they want to do, right? What is their kind of like flow state? is they want to kind of like deal with code. So they want to get like, you know, write code and produce code, maybe refactor and debug, but they want their lives to be kind of centered around code. Um, and then there's like, you know, some, some things on the sides, like you need to deal with source uh, control, you need to run tests, you need to get like deploy your code. Um, and then you need to get like you know get inputs to your code. Maybe you can like generate code um, if you if you're using got, like you know Ruby on Rails or something. And um, you might want to search code. And um, but really the kind of sweet spot is this kind of like authoring code, and that's the part that we want to optimize. So let's zoom into that. Um, and then we get this super simplified. Um, picture of the developer workflow. Um, and again, I don't get like pin me down that this is like, you know, an actual representation of um, a real workflow, but it's an abstraction, right? So um, we, we have that sweet spot there with the green arrow. Um, that's where developers want to be. Uh, they want to write code. And um, once they've written code, they run their unit tests, then they run their integration tests, then they do code reviews, then they deploy their code, um, and then they start again um, with some new task. Um, and all the kind of like, you know, the, the things in red are 
Thanks, Ted. Like, you know, take us away from writing code. So developers, like, you know, we, so we, all we're trying to do is to kind of, like, you know, make that inner loop more efficient. And as we all know, if you make the inner loop of a program more efficient, the overall um, uh, um, efficiency increases. Um, so let's start, kind of, like, you know, look at all these little kind of like, you know, bubbles here. Um, and see what, what we got like built to help there. So the first thing here is um, when you write code, um, what do you need, what do people do to get like speed that up? Well, um, a, a lot of people get like, you know, need to kind of search code, right? Like, you know, uh, sometimes we joke that our code coding is like plumbing, um, but it's a kind of like big part of the job. It's like if you look at the Android um, SDK, there's thousands of classes, right? This doesn't fit in anybody's brain. So um, code search um, and how to complete are essential in order to improve productivity. Um, and so we, we worked on, on several things here. One was neural code search. And um, that's kind of like um, searching code based on natural language. Um, aroma that was code search based on code snippets. Um, and then we worked for a long time on um, ML based uh, autocomplete. Um, of course, now um, there's a GitHub uh, uh, code pilot. Uh, that's another kind of example of, of this, this kind of work. Um, and here's the kind of thing that you know, um, as a developer, you want to. No, like how do I hide the virtual keyboard uh, using React Native? Um, that's not a task you do every day. You, you might run it once in a while. So that's kind of a query that you want to get right. Um, and then you want to find it. Um, you can go to Stack Overflow, um, but maybe like, you know, you, you have a, like an internal code base. Um, and so there's no information um, on Stack Overflow. So you want to search within your own code base. And that's what we did with a neural code search. Um, and so here I, I give kind of like, you know, examples um, of papers here. Like if you want to know more, you can always kind of go and read the paper. And the idea here is that you can like, you know, you take a piece of code, you turn that, you extract uh, that into a sentence. Um, and then you can use um, a vector representation to get like, you know, map that string into a, a vector space. And when you got like then run a query, you got like, you know, map that into a vector space as well. And then you find the gap, like, you know, the, the, the vectors that are, are close together. And to make this a little bit more concrete, um, um, uh, this is like, you know, a, a um, technique that's used a lot um, for this kind of search. So you have your code space here, you find an embedding into vector space, and that embedding is such that like things that are semantically similar in code become close in, in the vector space. Um, so say button and click should be mapped close together because these things that are related and maybe a thread and await are also related concepts that should be mapped together as well. And so that's the kind of underlying technique that we used for this uh, neural code search. And um, there's also kind of like related work here. If you go to code.go2vec.org, you can play with this kind of like embedding and you will find these kind of same analogies that I showed here. Um, another thing that we did is to get like, you know, search code um, using code snippets. So maybe you can like, you know, you're, you're using a new API, you don't know kind of quite how to use it. So you write a little snippet um, and then you get a recommendation to say like, hey, um, yes, in order to use this API, you have to use try catch around it. So this allows people to get like, you know, to, to um, learn um, or get code recommendation based on code snippets. Um, and, um, so that's aroma work. And then we got, like, you know, did a lot of work also on um, code predictions or autocomplete. Um, and again, we don't have time to get, like, talk about um, a lot of these things in detail. So next thing here um, is unit tests. 
um, and fixing bugs. Um, so if you look at um, unit tests, um, like you, you run a, a lot of tests, but like typically, um, you know, there's always Murphy's law, right? Like, you know, all the tests pass and then they have like, you know, the one test that fails is at the very end and now hours are wasted. Um, now what you can do is you can have like, you know, order your test randomly and then hope that like, you know, that test that fails um, get, like is somewhere in the middle. Um, but what we did there is we ranked the tests um, such that the tests that are likely to fail are run earlier, and then the tests that are not likely to fail um, are run later. So this is an example of ranking. Um, there's a whole bunch of literature about like you know automated like you know uh, test um, selection, um, and get like you know. One of the things there is people want to know um, why did my test not run or why did it kind of like pick this strategy? Um, and so one, one thing that like, you know, um, we noticed is that um, the distance between your test and the kind of like, you know, the target, the, the com a compiled target, if that's large, then, you know, the test will probably not have a lot of um, influence you don't need to run it uh, to be concrete if you're changing something in the ui you change the, the color of a button you don't have to run the unit tests for um the network stack right because that's very far away so that probably won't fail um so that's kind of like you know here's the paper about it um as I said, like, you know, people want to get, like, understand when we're using machine learning um, to, in this developer workflow, they often want to understand why the, the model makes a certain decision. So that's some newer research that we're doing where we're kind of trying to get, like, you know, have these models explain why um, they made certain decisions. Um, and that's very important for developers to accept this kind of work. Um, now, the next thing, which is interesting, is um, can we automatically fix bugs? And the idea here is that, like, you know, if you look at, um, we need training data, but there's a lot of training data about code with bugs and code where the bug is fixed, right? So a, a developer checks in a fix for a bug, we, we have training data right there. So that's what you see here, examples of bugs and their fixes. Um, and then from that, we learn a model that can um, automatically fix bugs. Um, and this one uses, like, you know, besides machine learning techniques, it also uses some very old technology from the 1970s uh, called anti-unification to get, like extract uh, common patterns from, from uh, different um, fixes, right? Like if you find two fixes that just change in the names of the methods, you want to get like you know um, turn that into a pattern. So whenever get, like you know you um, um, extract, yeah, so that you extract a common pattern, and you have to be careful that you don't make it too general. Um, and so that was like a, like a more kind of like a, um, a, a HCI a challenge here. Um, so another interesting thing that we that we see a lot. Um, is when we um, when we have training data, you have I mentioned you have inputs and outputs, and that's what you use to get like train your model. But really, the what is the input and what is the output can often be reversed, right? So let's let's look at kind of like you know this bug fixing. Here I said like the training data is code with bug, and then the kind of like code without bug. But you can turn that around as well. You can say, what if I train a model that given code without bugs will produce a code with bugs? Um, and then you can ask yourself, why is that useful? Well, that will allow you to test your test suite, right? How do you know that your test suite is good? Well, you need to get, like, create artificial uh, bugs um, and then see if your test suite catches these bugs. So this is called mutation testing. Um, and this is something that we also kind of looked at. 
Um, and, and especially like, you know, this can introduce very, very sneaky bugs um, and that will kind of like really stress test um, your test suite. So, but I think the, the real lesson here is that you can often be creative and that like it, the training data, you can, you can often kind of turn it around, right? It's not like, you know, what is the input and what is the output? Um, think about like maybe I want the output to be the input and vice versa. All right. Um, we mentioned here digital twins. Um, that's also something that we got like, you know, worked on. We call it the, the dub dub simulation. Um, and the inspiration here uh, for me came, comes from self-driving cars. So if you have uh, self-driving cars and you want to make them robust against collisions, you're not going to test that in the real world, right? You're not having like, you know, your self-driving car go on the highway and ask other people to try to hit that car physically and to see if the car can avoid collisions. You do that in a simulation. Um, and the same thing here, you can imagine if you have a social network, um, there's all kind of policies that we have to kind of like, you know, um, um, say to kind of like you know deal with um with certain issues that we cannot kind of like test in the real world so we got like run that in a simulation um and uh, like let me give you a concrete example say that we have like an outage uh, that happened what we can then do is like once there's a fix we can wait maybe kind of like you know a few months for the same circumstances to happen for that outage again and then it will happen in the real world that's not what we want but what we can do is we can rerun the kind of like you know the the situation that led to this SAF um, in the simulation with the fixed code and then see if it occurs or not um, and again like you know, there's a, a whole bunch of papers uh, that we wrote um, about this um, here. Then um, here's another thing, like if you look at code reviews, uh, this is where we worked on got like, you know, large code models, think um, things like BERT or GPT-3, but then apply to code and um, that can predict like, you know, does this code need code review or can I suggest who should review this code? Um, and this work is also used again, like you know, pointing back to the gap, like you know, the um, uh, autocomplete. Um, so there's like you know, we're, we're using a lot of transfer learning where you train this kind of like general giant model on code, and then you specialize it for different um, circumstances. Um, next thing here is. Um, when you start working, it's like, how do you know what to work on? Um, and also when there's like, you know, a bug or an issue, how do you find like, you know, who is responsible for that piece of code? So that's some other work that we did here. It's like work item prediction. So how can ML help you to find the work that's, you know, most useful to work on or most uh, pressing to work on? Um, and if there's like, you know, a bug or, or something happened, like who can we find, like, you know, who owns this piece of code or this database or this artifact in general? Um, and that's kind of like where, where um, ML can help you as well. Um, and the, the idea here would be kind of like, you know, um, if you think about work item prediction, you can think more science fiction likes like, can the system predict like, you know, oh, in the next five minutes, this developer is going to write some code. So can I already check out this code from source control, rebase it, load the editor, put the, the um, cursor at the right line and so on. And that's got like a little bit harder, but um, at, like easier things um, can well be done. And again, like, you know, this is um, described in, in these two papers here. Um, then, um, and I'm, I'm running towards the end of my 30 minutes here. Um, so one of the things is that I mentioned, like, you know, there's 3 billion um, um, Android phones around. So, and everybody here will have seen this. Once you deploy your code in production, um, no matter how well you tested it, no matter how well you wrote it, 
it will always kind of crash for some reason. Um, and um, you get these crash reports and there's like, no, if you have a lot of users and even if your code kept like crashes, hardly ever crashes, if you have enough users that will kind of like generate um, still a lot of these crash reports. Um, and so we built kind of like, you know, these ML um, algorithms to kind of given a crash or given a stack trace or given a profile run, can we predict where this bug um, is? So can we kind of like find the line of code that caused that bug? And looking at the stack trace and people here that have been in, in on calls, and typically somebody finds a stack trace, sees the kind of like at the top of the stack, there's or this exception occurred in this component, and they send it to the developer of that component. Well, maybe you don't know it. That's why you need the ownership inference here. Um, um, but that's not usually where the actual bug is. Um, and so this works really well. And um, another interesting thing here is that we twisted this one around as well. Um, so instead of given a, a, a crash, can we find the line of code that caused that crash? You can also train the model in the other direction. If given a change in code, can you predict whether this will uh, cause a crash? Um, so that's kind of like one of those things. Or given this new diff, will it cause a perf regression? And um, so, so again, like you know, these are all kind of things where if you're um, creative with what are the inputs and the outputs of your training data, you can train your model in both directions. Um, and there's a whole bunch of like you know papers uh, based on that. Um, there's more details. On, on my team's website uh, where you, you can find all these papers 